in your Hidden Color series, you, you've finished at part five. And you've covered a lot of things um, throughout it, economics, politics. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a theme that pretty much goes through all of them, and, and it's undeniable. But the, the importance of Africa is through all your themes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost more than even talking about America mm -hmm. in some of your, your series. But in, in some of your recent um, monologues, you have a lot to say about African folks. Mm -hmm. No, I, we talk about the importance of black people, including black people in Africa, the importance of black people. Because when we talk about hidden colors, we talk about black people all over the world, which we're all over. Yes. We talk about the black presence. There's black people in Asia. There's black people in um, Polynesia. We talk about the importance of understanding that black people are global, including Africa. And we talk about the importance if, of us all getting on code with each other so that we can become an empowered group. So that's the thing we talk about. Now, can, can we be in code with each other from being from different countries, but we all share the same amount of melanin, but you're from Jamaica, I'm from the United States, this person's from England. Can black people internationally be on code? We can be because the white supremacists are internationally on code. You understand what I'm saying? They're the global minority, but if you go to England, the white supremacists in England will act like a white supremacist in Australia, and the white supremacists in Australia will act like the white supremacists here. They never know or they've never met each other. They will all get on code. They know the code when they get around black people. Automatic. We black folks around the world, we don't get on code with each other like that. You get some black folks from um, Nigeria or black people from um, Jamaica. They get over here and they'll get on code with the white people against us in many cases. And that's the problem that we have. They're not getting on code as a black um, international group as we should, like the white supremacists do. And we're not trying to get on code to harm anybody. We want to get on code so that we can protect each other from white supremacist um, evil deeds. So is this really a huge problem that black immigrants come to the United States they align themselves with the white establishment. Is that a huge problem? That's a problem, and the reason why it's a problem, because a lot of them, and we have to be very honest about this, they come from societies in their homeland where they're tribalistic, and they're not even on code with each other where they're from. They have a gazillion different tribes. They are very tribal, and they are very hostile towards each other as far as getting resources, and then when they come here, they look at us as another hostile tribe, but we don't look at them the same way. We don't have that type of tribalism over here with black people, foundational black Americans. All black people are just black. We welcome everybody. We don't, our parents and grandparents don't say, stay away from those Jamaicans. Don't go to that Nigerian's house. We don't do that because we understand that we're all treated as niggas under the system of white supremacy. So this is why we fought for everybody to come over here who was black. Remember, white people didn't want let, they didn't want to let no black, other black people over here from the Caribbean or Africa. In the 19, like around 1915, 1916, they had a law that they were putting out here to stop um, black Caribbeans and black Africans from coming over here. It was black people on the grassroots fighting to thwart those laws. People like Booker T. Washington, other black people in Tuskegee fighting around 1915 saying, hey, we're not going to do that. We're not going to discriminate against those brothers and sisters who want to come over here. You're not doing it to white people because they had just built the Panama Canal down there in South America, Central America. So after it was done, they're like, OK, where are all these people going to go? Because the U.S. was helping to pay some of those immigrant migrants to go down there to build that Panama Canal. So now where are they going to go? They wanted to come here. They were like, no, we're not going to let that happen. Black people fought to get them here. That's how um, Marcus Garvey got here. Marcus Garvey got here a year later because the black grassroots was helping to fight for that. In the 1960s, the 1965 Immigration Act, it was black people fighting to get other African and Caribbeans over here in large numbers because we wanted them to act as reinforcement for us. We're fighting these white supremacists. We need some backup. So when people come over here and not get on code with us and get on code with the white supremacists, that is a problem. Well, doesn't it work that maybe the, the black immigrants that are coming from Carib the Caribbean and Africa may not get on code, but once they have kids here, and once those kids grow up, they grow up more like black Americans, mm -hmm. and then you get that second generation on code. Does it work like that? In some cases it does, but you're going to follow the, the instructions of your parents. If you got some parents 
who come from a, um, a background where they're somewhat hostile towards us because we hear all the time how immigrant parents sit up here and say, okay, you, you go find you some white kids to kick it with. Stay away from them, Akatas. They got all types of negative names that they have for Foundation of Black Americans. Akata in East Africa, some of them call us Jareers and Abids and the Caribbean. Stay away from those Yankee kids. So these people got all types of weird words for us and we're looking at them as just another black person. Hey, that's my brother, he's cool, he's dressed funny, and I'm a clown him for dressing funny. The nigga got on some bullshit clothes, but that's still the little homie, so we cool. So we can't have a one-sided pan-Africanism. That's why there's this FBA movement going on now, like, hey, we're gonna have to erase the board and let's start chalking up all of the people that's doing some shit that's constructive and the people that's doing things negatively. Because now, for a long time, we've kind of ignored the people from the immigrant class who come over here and just kind of be funny style towards us because it didn't really affect us. Now we're in a position where some of these folks are getting elected to certain positions where they're calling shots on what's gonna happen in our lives. So that's when we're saying, hey, wait, we can't have this person who looks like me, who looks black, but they're from another place, so they're not in the same realm as us. They think that there's something different from us, but they're acting as our representative. Hell, Barack Obama was that. He's not a foundational black American. Barack Obama's Kenyan and didn't do shit for black people. Yeah. You understand? I don't think people realize there's nothing black American about Obama. Nothing about him yeah. that's black American. And that, you know what? Now, I started to notice this about a decade ago. I said, wait a minute. I started looking at all the people that was connected to the White House who were in positions of power. And I said, wait a minute. These people, none of these people come from slave backgrounds in America. And I said, that can't be a coincidence. So Barack Obama, his family didn't descend from slaves. Eric Holder, he's from the Caribbean. His family didn't descend from well, slaves. Well, so there was a lot of slaves in the Caribbean. Which uh, no, no, I'm talking about here. I'm talking about here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah here, yeah. here. That's different. Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, no, right here. If you're from the Caribbean and you're black, you most likely are descendant of slaves. Right, right, but I'm talking about here. Yeah. A foundational black American. Yeah, that's, yeah. Very, that's very important. I think Colin Powell is from He's Jamaican. Jamaican. Yeah. He's Jamaican, yeah. right. <laughs> it's very different. You connected to the soil here because your energy is gonna be different. That's why when you look at movies now, when they talk about slavery and civil rights, they'll get a lot of African actors to do those roles now because a lot of Amer foundational black American actors who would do those roles, they would get on those slave plantations and those ancestral memories would pop up and they would kind of flip out. John Amos, he talked about being on the set of Roots in the 70s and they were filming on a plantation. He freaked out on that plantation because those ancestral memories come up. It gets too real for you. Our brother who recently died, Michael, what's that brother? He was in The Wire. Michael the, Williams? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was on, um, I think, 12 Years a Slave. He had a breakdown on the plantation. You did? He went down there and filmed, had a breakdown. A lot of our actors and actresses, they get on these plantations, and you feel that damn energy. So they don't want to hire black Americans to do that. So, so they're people. like, it, 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 if it gets real for them, mm -hmm. that's going to get real for the viewer. You know what I'm saying? That's going to transfer to the viewer. They don't want us to get it, you know, to get that energy that's too real like that. So they really make a lot of these movies for white people to enjoy.